Hi you guys, Ginger Cook here with Storytime, an acrylic painting. So just as a recap, the um, this is not a painting tutorial, though I will be painting an acrylic painting, 9 by 12 of two uh, birds. They're a native to Texas called a painted buntings. They really do look like an artist just painted all over them. I had never found them before. John and I had never heard of these birds, even though they're native to the southern part of the United States, like Texas and Florida and Louisiana and so forth. So the, I was excited. I think this should be my logo. I just, it was like, if God made a special bird, for he us. made, for us, he made this, right? Maybe for you too. Not for so, us. It's ours. It's, it's your birthday. It's my birthday. I'm your birthday them. present. So anyhow, today we're going to be talking a little bit um, we're going to be painting these happy birds and talking, talking about their other unhappy story, but interesting anyway, about the time the FBI came, a whole bunch of them, and came and raided my house and how that <laughs> happened, okay? Which no, is an experience you, you just don't forget, all right? <laughs> so I'm starting off as I'm starting off painting. Uh, we have to go back into history. I mean, you, maybe if you've been listening to story time, and if, if you're not new to story time, you've been listening to what... Um, uh, uh, um, our, um, see, is that, that was white, wasn't it? I don't know where we got, so I gotta get a different brush, man. I'm not getting the right color. All right, let me try that. You are white, right? Let's try some of this color. Okay, so, um, I want more white. Let's just put the white out here. I think that's the mistake with it. If you want thicker white, you've got to can't keep it on the board. All right. So again, this is not a tutorial, but this is an interesting story. Now, if you've been listening to the story times in the past, you may have known that my first husband's name was Colby. That was Cinnamon's dad. And um, when Cinnamon was 16, Colby and I got divorced. And, um, and I married George. And George is a lovely person, still is, not, didn't become unlovely. <laughs> you know, just because you're not compatible with somebody doesn't mean they're not lovely, you know. He was lovely, just, uh, you know, things didn't work out well. You could, some of this you may understand, some may not, as stories go on, but it's always, um, we'll hold our judgment, yeah? Absolutely. So, anyhow, G George was always the kind of a person that he could keep a secret to, you know, they always say never tell anybody a secret because two, two, people, two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead. Have you ever heard that expression? <laughs> well, but, it's true. but honestly, George could keep a secret tell it to his grave. He never t t told anybody anything. And um, he didn't care what anybody thought. I mean, this, was a, this is a great... Um, you think that's funny, but this is a, actually a, a rather marvelous characteristic to not give a rip. Uh, I raised my whole life thinking about what the neighbors thought. I really cared because my mother cared. And for some reason, you know, like, for instance, I had a friend who said that she went out on a date with somebody and they did weird things that she said they wouldn't embarrass her. After all, she didn't do them. But for me, if, if I went out and, for instance, Cinnamon's dad did anything weird in public, I just died, you know, just, oh my God, people see I'm with this crazy person, right? Like somehow his failure to be cool was somehow now um, uh, it reflected badly on me. I, I know that sounds funny, but I mean, that's how, basically, I don't know if any of you are like that, but that's how I was raised, that if you're in the company of, you know, of fools, then you're a fool too, right? It's <laughs> just kind of thing, right? We're so sorry, but you're, did you think you weren't? You're a fool too. So anyhow, um, uh, so George was, like I say, could keep, could keep a secret. And, um, and he did. For instance, um, the, I think the second year or so, we, we got married, we were married about the second year, and he had, George had, um, uh, second year of what? We were, got married, second year we were married, right? Oh, okay. Second, second year we were married, um, uh, uh, George's sister, his youngest sister, uh, told me about his, um, uh, um, 
Sorry, I'm thinking about something and telling you this too. It told me about the fact that he'd had a son. He'd had a baby when he was in, him and his girlfriend had had a baby in, when they were in high school. And, and, had been, and the child had been given away for adoption. So I waited and waited for years. And he never said word one about this child or what happened to him. And I told him, of course, I, you know, I'll share with anybody other, the, my life's horror stories. He knew all about those. But nonetheless, um, this business of, um, uh, you know, that this, this child never came up at all. And to me, that was just so interesting because I didn't care one way or the other. I don't know, you know, I don't know how the rest of you were, but if you skated through your teenage years not getting pregnant and, and a girl in the, in the 60s when there was, hard, there was no birth control and you were playing Russian roulette with stuff, um, and you didn't end up a pregnant, um, wow, good for you. Right? <laughs> but there were an awful lot of girls that did. And... Um, so, you know, the fact that he was so secretive about this seems so, so just, to me, I just didn't care, right? So, um, I guess that was it. I just didn't care, all right? And, but I just, I wasn't going to bring it up. He didn't want to tell me. If he was going to tell me, <coughs> well, he'd tell me, yeah? I knew and stuff, and, but we, we, and family never talked about his other, he had three uh, sisters, Still has them. None of them died or anything. I don't think so. Anyway, and um, and an older brother, and then one one brother that had died um, before he was born. So anyway, George was like the second oldest child in his family of kids. Okay. So anyhow, the the, uh, the that was interesting to me was that. Um, he, like I say, he never met it. Now, remember that I told you the time that Cinnamon and I went to France to paint. Do you guys remember that? There's that since story time where we, we went to, like I say, we went to France to paint. And um, uh, when we came back, we were gone for like a couple of months. And C Cinnamon was talking to uh, John every day, um, her husband, on the phone, practically daily. I didn't talk to George much. I think I called him a couple of times. But it was just when I came home, we had another person living at the house. And he says, uh, I want to introduce you to my son. And I'm going to just call him Bob because I don't want to use his real name, OK? Here's our, my son, Bob. Now, I knew about Bob from years, you know, it's like 12 years in the marriage. And I kind of I knew about him, right? But it was funny to me that this was how we were introduced. And he, like he was in his 30s. And it came about that um, when, when George's, um, um, George and his girlfriend got pregnant, they were like juniors in high school or something like that, junior, senior year, something like that. And uh, George apparently really loved her. And um, he, he took on extra jobs. He went and worked, and he worked three jobs to pay for the baby to be born. And he wanted to marry her. Now, his mother and the girl's mother were not having any teenage weddings. They weren't going to have it. Okay? This was not going to happen on their watch. I got to tell you guys that they were just not going to do it. And his mother and her mother especially thought that George's family were trash. And um, uh, because they were Marine Corps people and she thought they were just trash. And her daughter wasn't going to marry into that family. And so the child was given up for adoption. And George had no say in it. In fact, when the baby was born, he wanted to go see him, see the child. And they told him no, he couldn't even see it. And apparently, this one, this had a devastating effect on him. I mean, he didn't, he, you know, I don't think anybody understood how upsetting this was for him, that this had happened. So, um, anyhow, he um, never said a word about it. And then, apparently, the next year, graduated from high school and all that, went on to college and did, went in, did his thing, where... 
apparently the follow, the girl was, I guess, a year younger than him in school. And, oh, they never spoke after that either. Once their parents had laid down the rules about nobody getting to um, be part of this child, they weren't allowed to speak anymore. That was just it. The parents separated them and nobody was talking and that was just it, okay? So, anyhow, this is this not was not an uncommon um, thing in the 60s. My sister, when uh, she got pregnant, and um, she was given the choice of going to Switzerland and getting an abortion, or mar getting married. And that was that shotgun wedding. She got married, which you know, to a totally unsuitable person, and the marriage lasted less than three years, and only because it wasn't convenient. And she ended up. Well, maybe you've heard some of the stories, but it, um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing, you know. But anyhow, um, in those days, nobody just, you know, I can't tell you that having a kid out of wedlock was a big deal. Now nobody cares, apparently. But in those days, it was huge. It was a really big deal, and you didn't want to be one of the ones doing it. So, um, and I think, I think I was telling my friend uh, Kim this morning, I said, I think this all happened, you know, this all went by the grace of God. This, there, there would, could have been me, could have been me. I mean, I, you, you couldn't just run down to the local store and get birth control pills. There were no such things. Um, uh, you know, even boys were embarrassed to go buy condoms. And, um, well, there you have it, you know. Uh, uh, you just sort of, you took your... You took your um, life in your own hand. I mean, you know, when you you you, you did it. Now remember that when Clinton was uh, was elected president, there was a story running around that year about the, the his, his uh, attorney general, and he, he had appointed her attorney general of Arkansas, and the sto story about her was that um, she really felt that the teenage pregnancy was a problem. And there needed to be, um, uh, there absolutely needed to be um, birth control in schools, you know, like 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 at least condoms. Uh, kids ought to be able because it was so embarrassing. Boys couldn't go get them, and she wasn't wrong, right? The problem is, like everything else that happens, when the government gets involved, um, everybody goes for the lowest bidder, right? You're going to buy something. We're going to buy all these condoms for the kids in the school. You guys, maybe remember some of this. And uh, by the way, um, uh, uh, we're going to, um, just I'm thinking as I'm painting, and, and we're, so the condoms that, that the, the state of Arkansas bought were defective. They leaked, they had holes in them. And when she found these out, they'd already been purchased, apparently. This is what I read on the news. She'd already been purchased. Maybe someone else has a different story, but the result was the same. They went ahead and let the kids have them anyway. Better some condoms than none. <laughs> well, you know, I, on what planet is that okay, right? I'm certainly not. A, I'm sorry. So much of this in life is when you look about government and stuff, you're going on. On what planet? I think all of us, regardless of your political party, could say, on what planet is this okay? <laughs> Why is this okay, right? But sometimes it's just common sense, is this okay? Why would something like this ever be okay? Yeah? And so, um, uh, anyhow, uh, so like I say, that this is kind of a, this is, like I say, it could have happened to anybody. It happened to George and his son, Bob. Now, though, um, George, you know, never found out what happened to the baby. Never found out. Went ahead and he got married once and it was divorced a couple years later. And, um, but again, he never ever found out what the real deal was with, with that, uh, with the baby or anything like that. But it turned out that the next year she um, got involved with another young man, just Bob's mom. And um, got pregnant again. And you're going, really? And I'm going, yeah, she did. And so um, what happened then was uh, 
they, um, the baby was, this baby also was given up for adoption. Just the way it went. Sorry. This baby was also given up for adoption. Now, uh, fast forward 20 years, and the, the adopted, when she was a daughter, the adopted daughter realized that she had been, apparently her parents told her she'd been adopted. And uh, so she, she went to find her, her, her birth mother. So she, it took her a little bit, but she, just, she found out who her birth mother was, who was then living in Oregon. And her birth mother said, oh, by the way, you have a brother who's living somewhere, I think in California still, she told her. And so she found Bob and said, by the way, hi, I'm your sister. Did you know? And uh, your mom lives in Oregon. So somehow all of those guys got t together. And then, so of course, uh, he wanted to know more about what happened to his dad. Where was his dad? And so, um, so they took, the, she did a little more research and discovered that his dad lived in Texas, had been in California, but his dad now lived in Texas. So there was sort of a lengthy process, apparently, where they all decided to try and get a hold of George. And, um, and all this time, of course, George had truly been wondering what happened to his kid, right? All right? I mean, reasonable request, right? You know, what happened? So uh, apparently there were some letters going back and forth. He got the letters. He'd gotten a letter from somebody, but he didn't know who, and he was very upset by it. And he didn't know even whether he wanted to respond to even, because the child, you know, Bob wanted to meet him. Not a reasonable request, right? So, um, uh, anyway, I guess when C Cinnamon and I were in, uh, in uh, Europe painting and in France painting, um, they made arrangements for uh, Bob to come out and meet George and end, uh, ended up uh, moving in. And George gave him a job in his bird factory. He, had, he made bird purchase and gave him a job, hired him. So when, now, he never said a word. He didn't write me and say, you know, tell, you know, he said nothing. He just was going to wait till I got home and say, oh, by the way, guess who's coming to dinner and li moving in, by the way. How nice is this, right? Uh, and the thing is, I, Cinnamon was talking to her husband all the time. So I got the, he, he was just shocked to the court, her husband, John. I'm telling you what, he just was, and rightly so, right? So uh, he... Um, he kind of gave us gave a clue that George's son had had moved in. Okay. Guess what? So when I got home, there was this kid. He's like thirty years old. He's like this. Um, he and Cinnamon were maybe he's a little older than that because Cinnamon and him are like a year apart. And John and Cinnamon, he's in his early thirties. And. Um, he had no family. He didn't look like George at all. I mean, if you just looked at him, you wouldn't think he was George's kid particularly. There was nothing about him that um, um, that indicated that he was uh, George's kid at all. I mean, that, uh, that, you know, we could see. I mean, really couldn't. Um, but, you know, okay. So, uh, the thing is, we had a dog, and if you guys remember my dog, Tank, if you've heard the tank stories, a uh, tank big dog and um, like people really liked Bob. But if you stayed at our house, if you had the fun time of staying at our, if you ever stayed at our house, uh, even if it was a month or two and you left and you came back, the dog had never heard of you. The dog just didn't know you. Obviously, you left. You're not part of the pack. Get out. It growled. It might bite people. It growled. It was pretty fierce. Okay. 
So um, the thing about it, Bob went the, and Tank was, is that the dog always knew him. He was like a DNA test all by himself. <laughs> really? I think I'm kidding. I, I kid you not. That's exactly what he was. And so when, um, so anyway, uh, the thing about it was it was interesting because he didn't look at all like George. And George a couple of times questioned whether this was even his kid, particularly after some of the problems started to happen. But the problem is if you watch the two of them walking down the street together, they walked exactly alike, had the same walk. That's just, you know, a piece of trivia. I'm not saying that's anything, but, you know, there was no doubt in our minds that he was, you know, they're related. Maybe took up more after his mother than George, but definitely he was related, okay? So, uh, fast forward a little bit. Gotta get some color on my birds here. And and Scott's living at the house. George just got him working for us. He was a very nice young man. Um, he'd had a terrible life. I mean, you talk. He was the person. He was the reason why people might hesitate ever giving up a child for adoption because he was adopted almost right away. But um, his, um, his, it was during the Vietnam War, and everybody was getting drafted if you didn't go to college. If you either went to college or you, you, you were in for the draft, if you guys don't remember that, or maybe you're not from this country when you're hearing this story. And, but if you had a child or two, they, they wouldn't take you if you had a baby. So his adoptive parents didn't want any children. They just didn't want to go into, his adopted father did not want to go into, um, into, the, um, into the war, okay? Didn't want to be any part of the war, and who, who would, really? Um, so what he did was um, uh, he adopted two children. Now, this guy was so mean and his wife were so mean that um, they would write books about him. They should be in jail. They should be tortured. They should be hung from lamps until they bled to death. I mean, what they did to Scott was so terrible, or rather Bob. What they did to Bob was so terrible, right? Was that no child should ever have to endure anything like that. And so he was really broken. I would say he was broken. And he, he, he was a, um, he had spent some time in jail as a drug addict. And, um, and had been, um, oh, the child abuse that that kid went, went through was just, was tragic. So anyhow, and he, he tried to tell us about it, and George just didn't want to hear it because the guilt was huge, right? I mean, who wants to? Have, George had these, uh, George kind of imagined what, what happened. You always say, well, I, he had a happy home. He was now an airline pilot or a doctor, or he had a, you know, because I always say your kid will have a better home than you can give him, which was not true. George could have given him a much better home, as crazy as George was. None of that stuff would have ever happened. You know, George was not a violent person ever. Okay, and um, the idea that this should have ever happened was so crazy. Okay, and in the and he talked about it a little bit and explained that in his um, um, when he was you, you know he had gotten into drugs, which is understandable, and then. Um, and it also came out that uh, he was gay. Well, you know, this is a far cry from, and I'm not being facetious or anything. I'm just saying that what he at Georgia imagined and the reality of his child was just so, 
what they weren't in the same dream, right? Everybody has to dream about, well, what would have happened if you, you know, what happened to you? It's something great. And it was not in the dream, right? It just wasn't. And, and nonetheless, um, and as tragic as this was, and it was, it was terrible, right? And, you know, you wouldn't want anything like that to happen. Um, you know, and it, you're the nicest person, you've got to understand, he's the nicest, still is, Bob still is the nicest person. He's a wonderful person. But there's always a but, right? Um, um, he, he had a drug addiction problem. He's overweight. Um, and forgive me for saying this, and, and I will say it, but forgive me because some of you, cinnamon would go, oh my God, mother, I can't believe you said that on television. I'm just saying my perception of the, the, the lovely people I've met in my life that were gay, right, are the ones I've met are kind of mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all, like the Californians, you know, it looks mean a lot, right? And so, I mean, he, you know, he was struggling being gay. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't, I know that sounds terrible, but I gotta say, well, he had to work at that too, because I mean, it was just like, like he could you know, just go down to wherever people go, pick up somebody for the evening, you know? Um, and, oh, let's put it this way, he wasn't on the A list, right? Now I know that sounds, I know Cinnamon's going, I can't believe you said that, Mother. But he wasn't, right? And, you know, but very nice. And um, he was bald, lost his hair in the 30s, 33. And he'd lost, and from drugs and alcohol and stuff, he'd lost um, his, uh, his teeth. So he had, you know, so he wore dentures, you know, early, early in his life, right? And so he had, he had, I guess, what would people say that? He had a few, you know, few things that were a bit more challenging, right? And plus he, he, he had this drug addiction that he was constantly, and he was on medication for depression and stuff. He was on medication that was so strong that it was unbelievable, the, the medication he was on. Um... So, uh, so he lived. He, so he, like I say, he moved in and he went working. For, he went and worked for us, and a very helpful and pleasant person. And uh, we took up at that time. I was painting with them, um, painting for a company called IGI International, and um, I had sold a bunch of artwork, and. Uh, so had had gotten to um, had took the whole family to, on an 18-day cruise to Hawaii, including Scott, where he got to meet his grandmother, which, uh, his um, uh, the one that that t told uh, George she had that he couldn't keep him. He had that she was divorced at the time, struggling with with four kids and. And, and they couldn't afford to, he couldn't afford to keep them. I mean, it wasn't her fault, but you know, nobody likes to hear is that the decision you made then suddenly caused this kind of damage for somebody else. I mean, nobody really wants to hear that, do they? And there was some da damage done, right? So let's see, I want my black here. So it's just, and I just, you know, and again, you know, you just, you feel bad about it because, you know, I had been adopted and I knew what it was like to have parents that were, you know, were, were terrible. They certainly didn't rel relative in the class that uh, he had, right? They're absolutely terrible. But, um, uh, You know what, and so I, I knew what it was like to be adopted by people that that you really thought 
you know, maybe mine did it for the money, the social status of having kids, the fact that we came with our own money. Who knows? You know, and um, maybe they did it out of love. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, is that um, um, I, I mean, I, I had great sympathy for what was going on with him for that reason. Absolutely. And um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so so George ended up going to his AA meetings with him, taking him there because he didn't, you know, didn't have a car. And uh, uh, let's see, they and I kind of was joking with him. Well, it's not little league, but I guess it's something, you know. <laughs> Just all part of being a parent, dear. Hope you're in, enjoying it, right? But in, in fairness, um, uh, it, 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 I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to be mean or anything. But you know, there was certainly that aspect of it, you know, because you know we have to wait, you know, wait for him to get out of AA and stuff. And the problem is, he can still get a hold of drugs. And um, I did. So one time we were, we had gone on a trip to, to an art show in Las Vegas where I was having a big art show. We left him alone in the house. And um, he took the he took the truck and went on a drug, you know, kind of a binge. He went and binged down there in Houston and went on this big, you know, bender, I guess it was, with the truck, almost wrecked the truck. and. And we ended up in jail, and you know we had to bail him out, and it was a thing, right? But they, you know, they worked it out, and then they, they and and I like the fact that you know he, even though George was his dad, they fought like normal kids and parents. I always thought that was sort of cute that they they fought, and. Um, because he gets so frustrated because George would do the craziest things and everybody else got frustrated with George too. Just not not just not just Scott, but or Bob, but not he. They all got frustrated with him, but he he they they'd have these rip roaring fights. Um, you know, and it was sort of interesting. I mean, it's interesting to see because I never never fought with him ever. Um, those kind of things they fought over how something was going on at work or how. How George would do something, things like that, and you know, we I think we we puttered along there for almost a little over little over a year. I think is where we were were puttering along with um, some of this, as far as um, what. Um, the relationship between Bob and George was, and their their work and everything. And you just, you know, it's an interesting thing with the family. And so when we went on that cruise, of course, he told his grandmother all about what had happened to him. And um, of course, she felt terrible. Because, I mean, you know, you wouldn't, you know, it, you just you wouldn't wish what happened to him on anybody. And I keep saying this because I think it's important you hear this because the story gets kind of sad. And I think having the background of why people do certain things is important. Don't you, John? Yes. And I can tell you that, for instance, that some of the nice things that um, he did that I found extremely nice was um, when I, I was I, I had wanted to, if you guys remember, I had really wanted to get a painting video, and um, you know my own painting video that was huge, and I found those people. So I um, when we went up to um, to um, Gunshot, Texas to Gun Barrel, Texas or something to get the the uh, video done 
uh, Bob went with me. It was extremely helpful, and we put his name on the production and everything, and he was very proud of that and very, very helpful to me. And we kind of talked about it, and I tried to explain to him, he just, you know, having had um, in these experiences as far as parents that were a challenge, even though my challenge and his was a lot different, you know, I tried to explain to him that, you know, that the more you can just let that go, the better, because you're not going to change what happened. And if you get stuck in your whole life, just in a kind of, he was like in a, in a spin of, I'd be better, but this happened to me, and you know. Now, interestingly, his old, his brother, his older brother, had had experienced similar problems, um, and took it out on on Bob. Instead of making it better, he also, you know, he was the whipping boy for the uh, the other adopted child. Okay. So you, you, you see these things and you say, oh, surely not, but yeah, uh-huh. Surely, um, yeah, surely that's how it was. So uh, anyway, we, uh, we, very helpful. Um, dog loved him. Um, and like he did some crazy stuff, though. We took him on that cruise and he went out when we were in Hawaii and went and bought pot and could have, I don't know how he would have gotten home if they'd kicked him off the ship. But again, he never really got past the, the ADHD and, and drugs and problem and other things. And um, it, it was a pro, you know, it was, um, and honestly, honestly, I got to tell you guys, it wasn't his fault. You know, at some point, though, you know, when does it become, you know, when do you say, well, it's not my fault, but what am I going to do about it? You know, it's not my fault that um, um, I was born with um, whatever, but um, what could I do? You know, how could I, you know, how can I make this better? So we're all we're all bopping along pretty good here, right? And then um, there's a knock at the door, and I go to open up the door, and there's this lady standing there, and she goes. She shows me her badge. She says she's with the FBI. And did she you, wants did, to know did, if she did, can did, come did, in. And she did your heart her. sink? Huh? Did your heart just go? Bit? Well, I didn't understand why she was there. I mean, I was just sort of, huh, the FBI, huh? I mean, at that point, I wasn't, but just, and, and she wasn't alone. There were a lot of people. Now, I had nothing to hide. I mean, she wanted to come in and chat. I mean, I don't know why she was there, but, you know, it, uh, honest to God, I'm thinking maybe there was something to do with the neighbors and she wanted to ask us some questions. No idea, right? No, no clue. You know? Why was she there? And she wasn't just there. There was a pile of them outside. Like, uh, they were going to have to invade the house. I mean, there was a lot of them. And they'd been watching the house for days because they saw these cars here. And they thought, who knows what they thought was going on at our house. <laughs> Just, you're going, oh my God, Ginger. And I'm going, I know, oh my God, Ginger, right? Because, who, like I say, who would know what was going on at our house? Because you wouldn't, would you? You'd have no clue. I didn't know why they were there. Um, and also, George was sort of, he, George always wanted to be a cop, I think, in secret life. If, I, I remember um, getting on the cell phone when we, had started having, when we had cell phones and stuff, and, and we saw some guy, you know, commit a crime and, uh, um, uh, on the highway and, um, and then leave, you know, just kind of a hit and run. George got on the phone, called the police, and we chased this guy for several miles so we could tell the police where he went. 
And one time, one of our houses, uh, we had all these rental houses in Houston, and um, we gave the rental house to the, the, the FBI for, oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, they paid for it, but you know, we rented it to them cheap so that they could find a, I don't know, some smugglers or something. I don't know what they looked for. It didn't tell us, but yeah. So, you know, if they were coming to our house, it, I thought more they, maybe something was going on in the neighborhood. Maybe something that they needed our, I know, kind of help with, or maybe we could help. Because, like, like I say, George always helped um, that, you know. And he just did. He was just, you know, that was just how he was. So, anyhow, here they show up at the house. And you're going, oh my God, right? And so I have no reason to think anything different. And I let them in. I said, come on in. And it turned out that the reason that, remember, they thought all these people were living in our house because they were. We had, um, we had some vehicles. And at one time, um, I don't know, we had the work truck. And then I had a car. And that by that time, Scott, our, Bob had a car. And... Um, we were storing a car for Cinnamon over here while her husband could work on it. There were vehicles. People can people came and go for art lessons. You know, people came and went at our house. So um, anyway, I let them in. And. They, they said that, um, they thought that, um, and they said they wanted to, they said that they had been tracking uh, um, uh, child porn pornography, and they had, it, they had tracked the IP number, is that what they call it, the IP thing, right? They had tracked it to our address. And I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, somebody in your house is... Um, uh, you know, you know, downloading uh, child pornography. And I'm going, oh, no, I don't think so. Nobody would do that here. But sure, can we see you? Come on. Can we see your computer? Sure, come on up. And um, now, you know, most people would get a lawyer and get all that stuff. But, you know, here's the thing. If anybody, even my husband was doing that, um, they still would have come on up. Because I, you know, that's just it. Just so beyond the pale of anything I could imagine anybody doing. See what I mean? That I, I, just, I just, again, couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. So it turned out that yes, uh, Bob had been uh, downloading uh, this kind of pornography. Um, on his computer, he had pictures on his computer. They took his computer and they took my computer. They took everybody's computer. Well, we had to work and this was very inconvenient. Our computers were gone. They took everybody's computer because he didn't just have the grace to put it on his computer. They could have used, sometimes he used ours. Now, fortunately, he didn't put any on our computers, but he could have. So they needed to see. And they ran this program and eventually I got my my computer back, but I'm telling you. So he was, you know, upset that he got caught, obviously, um, and upset that we found out. Yeah, obviously, you know, that's not that wasn't in the plan, right? That we would ever discover anything like that about him, and. They didn't arrest him right away. He didn't get arrested right away. They took our stuff. But you know what? Um, that was a deal breaker for me as far as him living with us, right? The fact that it was on the... And, and, and George understood it, right? He was furious. And so... It didn't, 
I mean, you could argue, well, this is what happened to him as a child. And uh, this is how these kind of people are created, is that they're made by bad adults. And maybe that's true. I don't know. But uh, the, you know, we we just you know, we just said, "I'm sorry, you can't can't stay here anymore. You have to go." And um, so he went. He went up to see his mother in um, in Cal. In, it was his Oregon, I guess. Are we getting any weird comments on the show by now? Is anybody gasping and wondering <laughs> what happened, right, John? Not, not so far. So he went up to see his mom, and he they had been writing, and um, she had taken him on vacation once. They'd gone, she'd come down. I never met her, but she'd come down, I think, to take him to Disneyland one time or something. And they'd done something else. She didn't have a lot of money. She was married to a policeman. And um, her husband, you know, heard about this, and it was a, he was a retired policeman. He wasn't having it, right? You think? He wasn't having any of this. So, um, uh, Well, let's see, where am I going with this? I'm sure he's trying to paint the picture and tell it. So anyway, he, he stayed at their house for, um, I don't know, not long. And um, when I think about um, the, the term not long, I remember the first time, uh, in the, the, the first, when we first came to Houston, they had a, a Houston had a, a team called the Houston Oilers. And, um, uh, Jerry Glanville was the was the head coach and he was mad at a new referee and he said to him and there was a reported in the paper he said do you know what NFL stands for and he was yelling at him when he called it you fool or whatever he said we don't know what that stands for he says, not for long, not for long. That's what it stands for, not for long. I've never forgotten that. Well, anyway, um, when he went up to, Bob went up to see his stepdad, and his, his mom, and um, stepdad, he got, it was pretty, it was pretty clear that um, His um, he he didn't get a, re a warm welcome from the the you know his mom's husband, and and said so he said he can't stay here he has to go, so his mom, with filled uh, I imagine probably some guilt right for all this because of course she'd heard the whole story about what happened to him, and um, and all that after she gave him away, got him an apartment there in town and gave him a compu her old computer and just kept enabling him to continue on and he just continued on he went and found some more pictures and continued on like it had never happened and so uh he was, there was a trial, he was finally arrested, there was a trial, and he was found guilty. Now, it's interesting, and I want to mention this because um, please understand that he never, ever, as far to my knowledge, ever harmed a child. And the argument goes for some people then, well, if he never harmed anybody, why on earth didn't they just slap him on the wrist? And why on earth would they put somebody in jail? He didn't do anything. He just looked at some pictures. But what you've got to understand, and you, most of you I'm sure do, but for those of you who would make that argument, right, 
is that there's no such thing as it wasn't my fault or I'm, I'm not in league with that because some child somewhere had to be in that picture. Yes and yes. That wasn't just, uh, oh gosh, right? That was somebody's kid had been kidnapped probably and was in that photo. And if there was nobody buying the photos, and if there wasn't, you know, would it still exist? Oh, probably. In the in the in the depth of, of the world that has existed now, I don't know. But um, to be complicit is to have the is to have the photo. And I, th I think that that is an interesting, you know, it's an interesting subject, don't you think, John? Because a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily look at it that way, right? Right. They said, I didn't do anything wrong, I just looked at some pictures. And of course, nobody wants to think that they, you know, I would never do that. It's just, you know, it's just my business and go away. But, you know, it just isn't just that, is it? It just, it can't be. Um, and that's, let's see, I think I dropped my rag. So, you know, when the, I remember when they rang the doorbell and I saw all these, you know, cars outside, unmarked cars, and they identified who they were. I remember thinking to myself at the time, Oh my gosh, I've been watching too the law of attraction, I've been watching too many crime shows. What on earth are these people here for, right? And it saddened me because it's see in the most part, you gotta understand, I like this young man. Um let's see it. And I I wonder that and I tell this story because this is the kind of story that people don't tell on 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 television or you know on YouTube or something like that, they're not going to tell a story like this. Why would you tell that about your family? Because I say this, because somebody might, you know, have somebody in their family that they've noticed, perhaps is crossing the line there with photos that shouldn't be there on their computer, and thinking, well, it's just their business, nothing to do with me. Um, they're just looking at pictures. Nothing's happened, but something happened somewhere or those, for those pictures to exist. And if I had known that he had those pictures on his computer, I would have turned him in myself. I mean, no question about it. I don't know if George would have, but I would have turned him in. George has this thing about family. I think they can murder somebody. He wouldn't tell anybody. Just a secret thing. But for me, yeah, I would, um, I would have said something pretty quick, too. And Cinnamon and, and John were horrified. And of course, they had, Honey was just a little kid at the time. And they didn't want um, him anywhere near us either. So it, 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 so now what happens with this is that you know, and we didn't get away unscathed on this thing because our house, if you looked at, because he had lived with us, um, if anybody saw our house and, and we're looking up for uh, uh, child molesters in the neighborhood, our house now, our address was now part, was, it was part of that because they can do that now, right? So, it, um, yeah, and you're thinking, wow, huh? Really? Um, it is, and it was. Uh, let's see, I've got to get another color to get some more paint out here. So I just say that as a kind of a cautionary tale. Um, he went to prison for four years. Let's see, I'm still looking for some paint here. Here. And um, in Texas, and I don't think George ever visited him or wrote, when he got out, I told George, I said, if he comes out, it's not a matter whether I like him or not. He just can't come here. You know that, right? 
So when he got out, um, he, um, yeah, I think he did, he stopped, minus, if he stopped by, he stopped by when I wasn't home because uh, I wasn't aware of him ever coming by after that or having anything more to do with us. But, and they kept in touch, I think. And, you know, I, I you know, you think about these things and you go, well, what, what if something had happened? What if, you know, what if somebody at school had noticed that had, he had been coming home abused? I mean, coming to school abused and with scars and stuff like that. What if somebody, some adult had noticed? What if somebody had noticed that there was a child in trouble and, it, and, and had been for a long time? Because there can't, there are adults that might have seen it and stopped it. And, uh, I know adoption agencies are very careful about who gets adopted to who. They try to investigate people. They can't catch all the baddies. They just can't, right? I'm sure they'd like to. When Cinnamon was in high school, she had a friend, and um, uh, they, they hung out quite a bit. She and the, there's like three or four of them. They hung out a lot, and um, anyway, she had this really. This, and I liked the girl. She hung out, and they. Um, Cinnamon asked if she could come spend the night, and I said sure, because you know kids came and spend the night all the time. And that was no big deal. But she and she asked, so sure. And anyhow, um, the the girl girl didn't just come spend the night. I mean, she would she was there and she was there and the next day she stayed and then she went to school with her and then she still stayed and Finally, I said, doesn't this kid have somewhere? And I was working at the time. So it was like 16, I was working. Um, and I finally said, doesn't this girl have anywhere to go? Uh, no. Um, uh, and then there was this big, long story about why she didn't. And, uh, and, she's, and can, can she stay here? At this time, I was married to George. We'd just been married a little bit. They hadn't moved to Texas yet. So I said, well, um, and George said, yeah, OK. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. She says, um, I'll put you to work. You can um, you know, do some stuff around the house. And because you know, you know, Ginger and I are both really working long hours. And so if you want to help us out and work around the house a little bit, and, yeah, you can stay here, he said. So she, she did, and um, she's a nice, amiable girl. I liked her, and she, she was going out with a boy named TJ. And TJ was kind of a klutz. I mean, honest to God, TJ was such a, he was a hot mess, man, this young man. Um, he just was. <laughs> but anyway, she would go out with him, and then, um, Sometimes, you know, I mean, she would, I don't know about sneak out, but she was going out with him a lot. And I don't know where, I, it was, you know, she was, what, I think 17 at the time. Um, I think maybe, maybe she was 18, I don't know. But she was still going to high school. Whatever, however, she might have been 18, but still going to high school. So, anyhow. George's mother came over to visit. Now, this is a lady who had had, what, how many kids? A few. And like seven kids or something at one time, kind of the ones that lived, kind of the ones that didn't live. And she looked at me and she said, you know, 
Ginger. I said, yeah. She said, that girl is pregnant. I said, what? <laughs> what? She says, yeah, she's pregnant, Ginger. I says, how do you know? I <laughs> just, really? I mean, no way, she's pregnant, right? And she said, oh yeah, she's pregnant. And so I'm thinking, how am I going to approach this? Because you don't go up to somebody and say, I, you're pregnant, because if they're not, then they're just fat. You know what I mean? That is just like the rudest thing, yeah? You never want to go up to somebody and ask them if they're pregnant, but God forbid they just be fat, right? And then you've just suddenly insulted them big time. Yeah? Reasonable? Seems reasonable? Yeah? So, anyhow, she, um, I thought, I know how I'm going to ask her. And I, I, that one day I went up to her and I said, listen, she said, you're going to think this is crazy, and I'm sorry if it isn't. I just had to tell you because it's so crazy. And she says, what? And I says, I don't know if I should tell you. She says, no, no. What? What? And I'm like, well. She said, I, I said, I had a dream last night, and in my dream, you were pregnant. Isn't that clever? Come on, you guys. Isn't that clever? Oh, she said, Ginger, I didn't know how to tell you I am pregnant. My God, you must be so psychic. And I'm thinking, yeah, his mother's <laughs> psychic, not me. <laughs> Just not really me, but yeah, sure, right? I'll go for that. Yeah, psychic, that's me. Psychic. So... Um, so she, um, she says, I don't know what to do, and I'm psychic. And now, this was before George had ever met Scott. And of course, he was totally understanding about how this happens to kids. He had experience. Now, he didn't exactly tell me that, but now I understand why he did what he did. Because I, um, and why he was so supportive of the whole thing. Because, of course, this was sort of deja vu for him, right? <laughs> Just, you know, here's this girl, and she's pregnant, and it's all so sad, and, you know, whatever, right? And so he says, what we have to do is, you know, see that, you, you know, the baby's adopted. That's what we need to do, okay? And we need to find someone to adopt the baby, and you need to talk about that. We need to get a doctor and all that stuff, right? So, uh, we, we, so while he was doing that, I was talking to my sister on the phone. I said, you'll never guess, and I tell her the whole story about how this girl is now pregnant, right? I tell her. And, of course, because it's not like... That's, that's too good a story to keep to yourself, right? Guess what? Sedman brought his friend home, and oh my God, now she's a dread. And, you know, it's good for at least a 10-minute phone conversation, right? And everybody else goes, oh my God, how did that happen? And, you know, I don't know. And, 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 right? But first, before, before um, George is convinced that she should, um, she should tell any, she should... Um, um, you know, get, get the you know do the do adoption thing. He wants her to to tell TJ. That's the young man that uh, you know presumably got her pregnant. And and then maybe you know, now TJ TJ came from a family that um, had had some money, uh, middle class family, but they had money. His dad had a, 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 a I guess he installed elevators, okay. And um, so um, they had some money, and his dad no more wanted this boy to get hooked into one of those gunshot weddings. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't the least bit interested in having that happen at all. And, and you can appreciate that, right? Absolutely. You know, he didn't want his son to get rattled into it. And for the longest time, George was trying to get hold of anybody at the family, and the father was always out of town. But he's a, he was a busy, George was a busy body anyway, still is. And um, he's a busy body. He's one of those people, right? And um, so the first thing he does is um, um, try to get a hold of the family, gets hold of the grandmother in Kentucky. They have a big horse ranch, and 
I'm telling you, the family had some serious money. I don't know, is there money that's not serious, unserious money? I don't know, what's the expression? But we used to call it serious money when you never had to think about it in your whole life again, that kind of money, right? That, that's what I call serious money, when you never give it another thought. It's just money, like breathing. That's serious money. And they had that. And they had enough money where they were not going to let this little gold digger um, trap their son into marriage. And, and he wasn't real bright. He was a little bit naive and kind of dumb. You know, sweet, but his father knew what they had there, right? And he felt that this boy would get totally hoodwinked by her. And um, he wasn't having it. They weren't going to. And um, G George was very disappointed with that. He thought that the father should have stepped up. And in the meantime, she's sneaking out at night into his house at night, in through the back window to spend the night with him and, 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 and go, well, we, I'm pregnant. What are you going to do? Kind of thing. One of those little acts that she was going with. Well, not that it was an act. She was pregnant. Well, me, right? Now, she came from, apparently her dad lived in San Diego, where we were, but she, she didn't know him. And her mother was, had been uh, born out of wedlock, as they say, you know, had been one of those whoops babies at, has, at her grandmother. It's a whole generation of women that this had happened to. And her mother was living in Canada, didn't want her back. You're going, oh my God, Ginger, this is even a more interesting story than the FBI. And I'm telling you, it is, isn't it? So, um, uh, these are beautiful birds, aren't they? These aren't, aren't you guys just shocked that we didn't, you know, that these are in Texas? I've never seen one. So anyhow, the upshot, up, upshot is of all of this, you know, is that, um, I tell my sister, by the way, there's this girl staying at our house and um, she's pregnant. And then my sister goes and she's thinking about putting her baby up for adoption. And then my sister goes to a party that very afternoon, a luncheon, and then she needs something interesting to share with the guests. And so she says, you'll never know what gets to happen to my sister in, in California, this girl she was letting stay at her house, and um, she's pregnant, and um, going to put the baby up for adoption. And apparently, there was a lady at the party who had been looking to adopt a child. And for months, they had tried, and years maybe, I don't know, it was a thing. They had tried for the longest time and had not been able to, to put, you know, get that to happen. So, um, she says to my sister, oh, we've been looking for a child to adopt. I wonder if you could, can you be, put me in touch with the girl? And so, you know, uh, George and I both thought that was not a bad solution. And then Tammy thought, that uh, Tammy thought that perhaps that that she should, what did she get out of it? She just, someone took the baby, but that wasn't any big deal. Why should she let this woman have it? You're not allowed to sell kids, but perhaps she could get her to give her, you know, buy her gift or do something. So she was holding the lady up for money. I didn't know that. And, um, uh, so it, that there was, there was all, it wasn't that fast. They still had to go through, you know, this government and all that stuff. And, and then when Tammy went to the hospital, Cinnamon went with her and was, was there for the baby to be born. The lady had flown down, but she wasn't in the delivery room. And um, which I didn't think was such a bad thing for somebody around 16 to see. You know, maybe it's just a you know, birth control preventive. See someone else have a baby, perhaps that might, you know, discourage the urge for a while, right? I don't know. Just anyway, sorry. So she um, 
So the nurses at the hospital are saying, why on earth are you giving this baby up for adoption? You don't have to give it away. In America, I don't know about Canada, but where we all live, you can, um, the state will give you money and you can raise the kids yourself. You don't have to give the baby up for adoption. You just don't. Well, that's a different thing, isn't it? That's no, you know, so um, and they're trying to tell her not to do it. And George is all set on the baby being adopted. He is absolutely convinced that it's the very best thing that could ever happen to this child. He himself had done it, though he never told us why he thought that. And uh, you see, you have to have one story before you can really appreciate the other, yeah? And he's, he hears about this and he calls her, are you nuts? This is woman, and so, and then the baby, I guess, had some medical issues that when she was born, not, not bad, but some. And, um, uh, so uh, um, uh, the, the, the lady paid for those, too. The lady, the one, that, one of the kids, she paid for that, too, right? She paid for all that stuff, and she, she paid for a lot of stuff is what she did. And then uh, finally, and I say finally, I mean finally, she was... Um, she, you know, she got, they got the kid. And, and Tammy gave the baby up for adoption, and and she did, and um, that was kind of the that was the end of it in that in the sense that, um, and you know we all hoped that that was a good home, and that maybe the universe intervened and found that child the most best home ever, right? But now fast forward to my sister-in-law, my brother Jay's wife, is a social worker. And she hears the story and goes ballistic. What is the matter with you two girls? What on earth have you done? Are you both just that stupid? And she just tore into us. What on earth were you thinking? That is so incredibly dumb. It defies all incredibly dumbness. You know what I mean? <laughs> kind of thing, that kind of thing, right? And, and we're going thinking we'd done a great thing, right? Not knowing the story of Scott, uh, Bob, right? Not knowing that story. We think we've done something. We couldn't imagine why anybody would think we'd done anything but a great service to mankind, right? We, we, you know, everything was good. And uh, she explained to me that, 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 you know, that, you know, when people, children are adopted, that, um, uh, that the family is interviewed, and they don't just get to pick up a child like at the supermarket. They interview what kind of home is it going to have, and you know all of that stuff. And we had skipped all that process by just not going through adoption adoption agency. And another family might have been better for that kid, and you don't know. And um, uh, there was just a lot more than hey, we know someone that has a baby, you like a puppy, you want a, you want a baby, right? This will be good. You should have this baby. So I don't know. You know, the qu question is, did, did the baby have a good home? I never found out. I don't know. Did the baby have a good home? Maybe. Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. I think it was a girl. Uh, it's just interesting to me, the perception of um, um, uh, how you know? Look, you only can go with your own experience, right? You're not. We weren't. My sister and I weren't trying to do anything bad. We really thought we were helpful. Yeah. Uh, George's family, when he was younger, didn't imagine that when they put this child up for adoption and tried to save, you know, the life of one kid who had his whole future in front of him and didn't need to be saddled down trying to raise a child at 17. Had they sacrificed another one? Yeah? You don't know, do you? That's the thing. You don't know any of this, 
when you do these things. You just, uh, we can't know how the, I think maybe, maybe some of the story time things might be fun in the sense that uh, you really don't know uh, in life where it takes you. I think that's probably the uh, something I could say. You don't know where it takes you and where it takes people and what their destinies are. Is it destiny? Was he meant to have those parents? I don't know. Maybe. I don't think so, but you know, some people might think that. Uh, Uh, had there been be better birth control available for kids at that age, um, might that have had a different different outcome than it did? Maybe. I don't know. Um, these are the kinds of things that when you think back in life and say, what happened here? Or, How did that person end up that way? Or, some people go on to do great things. I know when um, they checked the, from because of the way my parents um, handled the adoption of us kids, which they actually never adopted us until we each all turned 21, how they handled that, the adoption laws in the state of Washington were changed, and my brother fought for that. But honestly, when I think back to the, the, the judge and Punky, they were fine, in a sense, you know what I mean? Maybe not the best parents. Does people ever get the best parents, even if they're your birth parents? Are they the best parents? Would those people that had adopted Bob, would they have been better parents for their own kids? I don't think so. I think they were just kind of mean, horrible people. Wouldn't have mattered who, who they were being horrible to. Maybe because it wasn't their kid, they could justify being awful to him. How did they get so awful? Yeah, huh? You just think, you know, you think about these things, and it's just, to me, it's very interesting because um, so many different things happen to people in, in their lives. And a lot of you guys have probably have similar stories or things like this that, that you know about. And so I have to tell you, I've enjoyed very much the, you know, doing these story times because it's sort of fun to go back and look at your life and say, wow, that's what that happened. I remember that. Gosh, remember when, oh, and the little girl in that, and that young lady stole from us too, the one that we were helping with that was pregnant, Tammy. Turned out she was stealing from us. Um, and guess what, you guys, this is even the best part. PJ was not the father. She made it up. He was a different guy was the father. He was never the father of that baby. And thank goodness for a DNA and the A test today because back then there were none. This was before DNA. And the father was whoever she said it was. That's what's so incredible to me, is that uh, after all of that and all that sneaking around and, you know, and I've got to be with him and he's the love of my life and I've got to be married to him. Um, why, I mean, he was such a little, you know, he was very mature boy is what he was. He's probably a wonderful grown up but at the time he was. His dad certainly understood what was going on, was no fool. And um, uh, 
uh, you don't get a lot of second chances in life, you know. Um, I've gotten many, you know, kind of do-overs for regardless of, you know, how my life first started out. Uh, I'm having fun putting colors on these birds now, I gotta tell you. I have never seen birds like this before. Um, didn't know they existed. Um, I think they're way cool. These, uh, these are called painted, really, that's their name, painted... Painted buntings. Bunions. Buntings. Bun, 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 bunkins. Bunkins, right? Bunkins? Painted. B-U-N-T. Buntings. It's buntins. but with an N in it, baby. Buntings, like bunting. But, like, like buntings. Like bunting is a thing, is a fabric thing. Bunting is a fabric. Well, these aren't fabric. These are pretty birdies. Yeah, but like painted. Yeah, no. Um, I, uh, like I say, I'd never, never seen birds like this. And when we were looking around and thinking, man, where, these are just, you know, this is the kind of bird I would have made up. <laughs> you guys, this is the kind of bird I absolutely would have made up and just, this is, this, again, if you want to know more about these birds, you're going to listen to the beginning of the video about where they come from and everything. But they're in Texas and Florida and places like that. Southeastern uh, United States, primarily. Yeah. And uh, they're way cool, I think, don't you? If I was going to be the bird, that's the kind of bird I want to be. Yeah, but if you were going to be a bird, wouldn't you want to be this bird, right? Absolutely. Wouldn't you want to be, be a bird like this? Yeah. So we're probably close to wanting a frame for this. For, for those of you who are... This story time went very, very quickly. I didn't really pause to dry anything. No, you just focus their painting and storytelling. And telling you the story. Um, and that's true. That's what I was focused on, absolutely. But I'm going to just do a few little luminous colors on this. These birds are so bright that I think I need a few luminous colors. Luminous orange. Not too much, just... Just enough. Just a touch. Don't want to overdo it. And uh, let's see, I put this little brown. Oh, 
I don't know. Uh, as I think back to the stories that you can tell people, I think this is probably one of the more interesting ones, don't you? Just in the sense that, um, again, I say that, you know, again, you can't, you know, you can't, it doesn't matter what family you're born to, you could be, they could be your own parents and just be total turds, you know? This doesn't, um, you can't guarantee that would happen. And there's a school of thought that um, some people believe that you come into this world and you pick your parents. And uh, some people believe that uh, parents are a, um, you know, children are the, uh, teach, the ch teach the parents, you know, because they generally just don't fall right in line, do they? Everybody's a little bit of rebellion. Maybe there's a little bit somewhere in everybody, a little bit of a rebellious spirit says, I'm sorry, you're nuts, I'm not going to do that. When I saw my parents, my mother, how she treated people in restaurants and others, I, I knew I didn't want to be that, you know? Um, am I a different person than, than I would have been if I hadn't been around her and seen not just the good examples, but the bad example, right? Those are interesting thoughts in itself, aren't they, John? Indeed they are. You know, who would I be if they hadn't been my parents? If I'd grown up mm, with all The path not taken. Yes, you don't know. We make but, decisions all through life. What if? At some, some point you have to quit bearing, blaming the people that raised you. Would you say that was fair? And... Um, And just say, okay, this is my life now. What am I going to do about it? Yeah? Yep. These are the cards I've been dealt. Yeah. So if you want to know, these, again, these are not tutorials. This is story time. And... Uh, I'm going to come under here with a blue pen, I think. I've had the fun of learning about birds I'd never heard of until this morning, right? I mean, that's pretty neat in itself, isn't it? Yep. I think so. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just dry this and sign it and show you what it looks like in a frame. You are, are you? Mm-hmm. Well, who's going to get that frame for Well, you? I bet you are. Oh! It's a 9 by 12, though, not an 8 by 10. We did a 9 by 12? Did we? No, we did an 8 by 10. It was wow. an 8 by 10. Oh, so we have one of those cute little blue frames, don't yes, we? Yes, we do. That's what then I can finish doing any of the other little bits that I want to do with All that. All your little bits. All my little bits, you guys. You're, you're I have kibble bits. and bits. Yeah, I've got little bits I could do. You know, something else I might, I might do. Yeah, I'll do all of that stuff, right? I want a light blue color. You're thinking blue. I'm thinking green. John's thinking green. I'm thinking blue. We got options. All right. Well, um, let's just put the. Did you show a picture? Oh yeah, I want you guys to see. There's one in real life. What the real ones look like. Not the fake ones. Not the fake ones. Pretty cool, huh? That's what they are. They're adorable. So. Um, oh yeah, huh? 
what's not to like, yes, as the saying goes. What's not to like about these? I mean, they are, they are wait, way, way cool birds for sure. And this type of stylized art, which I really like. What's your style? Yeah, it's more of impressionistic. You know, anybody said, you know, people say, I would just, you know, just take photographs of birds and paint them. Well, yeah, but could, could you go a little further? What else could you do? Does it have to be... Um, you know, what, what could you make it more a little more interesting? What could you do to, to, to make it that way, right? Um, that's, that's probably my thing, is that how could you make it more interesting? Uh, all right, John, you, you've got the frame. I'll, I'll dry it and come on and... We'll leave this picture down here so people can look at this bird while we're framing this, okay? There we go. Let me just do this. That's not much of a drawing. But it wasn't very wet. No. No, it's got to be the green one. <laughs> uh, who's the smartest of them all? You got <laughs> so that's the new mirror mirror on the wall. Who's the smartest of them all? Is that what you're telling me? You betcha. These little frames, again, Jerry's our Robert does not give us any, uh, not five cents for mentioning that. it, but wow, huh? Yeah. Uh, that's a keeper. There well, you have it. That's a keeper it. for somebody. Uh, there you have it. Um, Final touches while it's in the frame. I always love when you do that. Well, we hope everybody enjoyed today's story time. Don't know what we're doing tomorrow because it's the Queen's birthday. So Official this may day. be our only story time this week. We don't know. We don't know. But we appreciate you guys, your comments and your... Um, Let's see, let me just really shake that pen up. It's been sitting there too long. Appreciate everything, and we appreciate the fact that you hang out with us for these Storytime shows. And uh, uh, I try to bring it some, something interesting each time and maybe um, a little different. I want something really bright or red right there. Where's my... I got the luminous red here. I need something a little brighter. What can I get here? Small. There. Sometimes you just want. That's that red. Isn't that great? There we go. Just just pop that color a little bit. That's that whole bind luminous. Luminous red. And, and I will be looking out now that I live in Texas for birds that look like this. I'm excited about it. And I hope the person that uh, gets this per painting feels like uh, these are their art birds. Yes? I would think so. Well, maybe one of the eight by ten people will see it and, and lay claim to it. If there's an eight it. by ten person out there that hasn't claimed their picture yet, we'll just mail you one. We'll just pick one and mail it. But if somebody is getting an eight by ten wants to claim this one, do it before we'll it do, ships. Do it before it ships, because if otherwise it'll get shipped out. You know, might might want to let us know. All right. Thanks, you guys. I hope you have a wonderful day and um, appreciate your comments and thoughts about today's story. 
a lot of people might not have told it. Um, I think it's a cautionary tale. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. And uh, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Tell others about our story time. And uh, remember, we offer on our online art school, which is self-paced. You just do it however time you want. Even if you do one painting a month, you get personal art coaching. And um, that's uh, that's the, the, the gift of uh, the gift of time because we take so much time off of your learning curve on painting. So if you want to, you want the gift of time, you know, subscribe to our channel, paintingwithginger.com, or our website, and become a red or purple member. And uh, let me help you have more time in your life by learning how to paint faster. Bye, everyone. Bye.